Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice's first community teaching this year. Um, it is entitled Slavery, Justice, and the University. Um, this teaching was organized by two of my friends and colleagues, Serena Gordon and Michael Becker. Serena's in the back, so thank you, Serena. And um, Michael's here in spirit. Um, and before I get started, I'd also like to plug one other. Um, oh, I haven't told you who I am. Um, my name is Brian Pindinger, and I'm a junior concentrating in history and Africana studies. And I'm one of the student representatives on the student advisory, co student advisory committee on, um, for the center. And the project that I'm working on is a multimedia submission contest called The Hands That Move Us. Um, in that contest, we're asking students to submit poetry, art, videos, all sorts of media that deals with the questions of transatlantic slavery, modern day slavery, or forced labor and justice, kind of broadly defined. Um, there's there's boxes on that um, back pedestal in the back, and you'll see posters and all that stuff um, around campus. Um, the deadline for that is April 1st, and we're giving all sorts of awards to people, um, and so, some of the work we're gonna try to um, present at the center's end of year exhibition. So all sorts of cool stuff happening with the center um, this, this semester. Um, before introducing the panelists, I just wanna make sure everyone knows about um, this little book right here. Um, this is the report of the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. Um, this book is online, it's colorful, it's accessible, it's easy to read, um, and if, if you guys are interested in what our panelists have to say today, I highly recommend that you all um, take a read. Um, it's nice. <laughs> um, okay, um, and just to introduce this um, teaching, today um, this teaching aims to explore Brown University's relationship with slavery in the United States and with transatlantic slavery more broadly, um, and furthermore to discuss the actual center for the study of slavery and justice, the actual report, and what that means for Brown, what that means for Providence. Um, today, our three guests are Professor Anthony Bose, um, uh, Marco McWilliams, who just stepped up, and Seth Rockman. Um, and they're both the three men that I've had the honor of learning from in many different capacities. I actually just ran over to a subdocking seminar right now. Um, so I'm very excited to present them all today. Should I wait for Marco? <laughs> um, well, I guess we'll start. We're going to be going um, the artist Seth Rockman, then, um, then Marco McWilliams, and then um, Professor Bogues. Um, so I'll start with the introduction. Seth Rockman is a specialist in um, revolutionary and early Republic United States history with a focus on the relationship of slavery and capitalism in American economic and social development. The histories of race, labor, and social welfare are central to his research. Rockman supervised undergraduate research for the University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice and is now conducting his own research on the relationship of northern manufacturing to the plantation economies of the South. He's an associate professor of history here and we're excited to have him. Um, next, who will be presenting is Marco McWilliams. Uh, Marco is an educator, published writer, and community organizer with a concentration in Africana Studies from Rhode Island College. He is the founder and deputy director of the Providence Africana Reading Collective. Marco, uh, Marco teaches as an adult basic education instructor at the Amos House and is presenting a workshop on youth politics and media in the 21st century with the Milford Robertson Academy based out of the Department of Africana Studies at Brown. He also organizes in Providence with the Direct, with the direct Action for Rights and Equality Prison Reform Committee called Behind the Walls. Marco, Marco McWilliams is a volunteer youth mentor at the Providence YMCA, um, Church of Providence, and the New Leader Councils, New Leaders Council of Rhode Island. And very soon, Marco aims to pursue a PhD in Africana Studies. Lastly, we're going to have Professor Anthony Bogue speaking. He is the director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and is also the Harmon Family Professor of Africana Studies here at Brown. Bogues' major research and writing interests are intellectual, literary, and cultural history, radical political thought, political theory, um, critical theory, and Caribbean and African politics. Um, he is the editor of two volumes on Caribbean, on two, edit, two volumes on Caribbean intellectual history, 
and has published numerous essays and articles on the history of criticism, critical theory, political thought, political philosophy, intellectual and cultural history. Um, so with that, I'd like us to welcome Professor Seth Brockman. Brian for that kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have waited a long time for there to be a Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University, and I am delighted uh, at how readily Professor Bose has launched us this year into an array of programming and positioned us to make really important interventions uh, both to the life of this campus, but also uh, in our national civic culture, where discussions of slavery still need vastly more attention than they've gotten. There are two items in the news this week that uh, perhaps you're familiar with, but which give you some sense of why these topics are so urgent. The first comes from Atlanta, where the president of Emory University wrote in the Emory Alumni Magazine a column calling on our political leaders to do a better job of compromising, to put aside their political differences and doing what's best for the country. And he went back to the Constitutional Convention of 1787 to find an example upon which he could draw to show political leaders overcoming great differences in order to come to common ground. It turns out, he wrote, that some people thought that it was important to count all of the slaves in a state's population for purposes of representation and taxation. Yet other people at the Constitutional Convention thought that it was important to count none of the slaves for purposes of taxation and representation. And what a wonderful compromise it was when they realized that they could count three-fifths of the slave population and add it to the population of the whites in a given state to come up with an appropriate number that everyone could agree upon for purposes of direct taxation and representational apportionment. Needless to say, the president of Emory University might be the first American in a very long time to herald three-fifths clause as an important and positive development in American political life. Yet there it was in 2013. Just this past week, news has come out of England. A project at the University College of London has done tremendous work on the biggest reparations case in the history of the modern world. A reparations case that will blow your mind with its significance. In 1833 and 1834, the English government decided that it wanted to issue reparations for slavery at the amount of 20 million pounds, which was 40% of the annual operating budget of the British Treasury. And so it did. But in this slavery reparations policy, the people who received reparations were slaveholders rather than former slaves who had been emancipated in the British West Indies. And sure enough, thousands upon thousands of British men and women who were slaveholders themselves, who were the descendants of slaveholders, who owned small pieces of property in slaves and in plantations through sophisticated financial instruments like annuities, wills, and trusts, received payouts that allowed them to pump money back into their own ascension to higher ranks within English society. And the University College London Project, which now has a website that you can visit, shows you the names of these thousands of individuals, many of whom might be known to you because the descendants of inheritors of these reparations are people like George Orwell uh, and Graham Greene and others uh, who are familiar figures of the 20th century and whose position and prominence is not unrelated to this British policy of reparations. This is just this last week. So when we think about issues having to do with slavery and its legacies in the modern world, we don't have to go very far. We don't have to stretch. You don't have to go past section A of the New York Times in any given day to find these kind of issues that are pertinent and at the center of our lives. But here at Brown University, I think we're doing something very special. And we have a particular obligation as a university that has been at the front edge of these discussions for the last decade. And this owes to the decision that President Simmons made in 2003 to investigate the institution's relationship to slavery, but more generally issues of institutional responsibility towards past injustices. And this act of courageous leadership on the part of President Simmons is perhaps one of the things that makes me prouder than any other thing about being a Brown faculty member. And few things make me happier than the Slavery and Justice Report, not because it's particularly pleasant reading, not because this is a past that uh, in any way I'm proud of, but because the obligation of the, or the, the, the willingness of this university to ask hard questions about its past 
and about its present and future distinguishes it from virtually every other leading institution in this country. And I don't think many of us here who are here today who were not here in 2004, 2005, 2006 can necessarily grasp how significant this initiative was on the part of President Simmons, on the part on, in the life of the faculty, in the life of the students who were here at that time, but more generally in American higher education. In 2011, there was a conference at Emory University, again Emory University, but in, on one of its better days, uh, called <laughs> Slavery and the University. Uh, and it was a conference for academics and, and activists to figure out ways in which different universities had thought about their slaveholding past. And people came and gave talks about the fact that the president of University of Alabama uh, was the legal owner of that college's campus's slaves in the 1830s and actually whipped people at faculty meetings. People came and told stories about a runaway slave from Maryland who ended up on the Princeton campus serving as the janitor of Nassau Hall in the early 1840s. People gave talks uh, about efforts to recover the past at College of William and Mary, uh, at the Citadel, at numerous other universities. The keynote speaker of that event was President Simmons. And I thought, okay, well, that's my president. Uh, uh, what, what, what interesting can she have to say? I mean, you know, this, this report came out in 2006. It's now five years later. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of action on Brown's campus. Uh, the entire student body has turned over. Uh, how can this still be relevant? And then I saw the standing ovation that President Simmons received there. I saw the outpourings of respect, of admiration, that were shown to President Simmons by educators and activists from around the country. And people came up to me again and again and again and told me how remarkable it must be to work at an institution that has owned its institutional relationship to slavery. And it's true, it is a remarkable thing, particularly when you compare Brown to other institutions, such as Yale, such as Harvard, such as Princeton, who have not made any meaningful effort to investigate the relationship of its founders uh, to the Atlantic slave trade, or to think about institutional responsibility based on these past injustices. Yet is this enough? After all, several years had passed, many years had passed at this time, and Brown's ability to make good on many of the promises that were spelled out in the Slavery and Justice Report and were ratified by the corporation had not been made good on. After all, plans had been made to erase an endowment fund for Providence Public Schools. Plans had been made to uh, commission a memorial for the main green. Plans had been made to start a new scholarly center. And very little of this was to be seen in 2011 or even in 2012. And one had some doubts whether or not anything was going to happen at all. And so it is for that reason that, as I said at the outset, I am so proud and pleased with the work of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and the programming and possibilities that are being raised through uh, such events as the, the film series that took place this month or teachings like the one that's taking place now. I want to spend a little bit of time, though, taking you back to those heady days in 2004, 2005, 2006, when the Slavery and Justice Initiative was launched on campus and give you a sense of what it meant in the life of this campus, particularly for some of the undergraduates. My relationship to this is as follows. I arrived on Brown's campus in 2004 as an assistant professor. I had come here from California where I had spent some time teaching courses on slavery and memory in the United States. But the moment I stepped on campus was the start of the fall semester in 2004 when this initiative was beginning. It had been convened the, the previous spring uh, a fairly disastrous article had appeared in the New York Times in which the uh, committee chair, uh, Jim Campbell, and President Simmons had been quoted in a strange, somewhat out of context way that made it appear that the entire project was geared towards allocating the university's endowment towards reparation payments to the descendants of slaves. And a lot of defensive work had to be done in the wake of that New York Times report. But in the fall of 2004, the university began doing what the university does best. And this is something that I learned from President Simmons and I think is really important. What does the university do? The university offers the space for sustained and deep engagement with troubling issues. The university offers the space to really think and think hard about what was and what can be. And so in the fall of 2004 launched two years of rigorous programming looking at slavery in its historical contexts, but also in its present-day manifestations and legacies. 
We had a great number of speakers here on campus, virtually every other week, ranging from John Hope Franklin uh, to John Conyers, uh, to scholars of the Atlantic slave trade, to politicians, um, to pundits, people like Adolph Reed, people like Roy Brooks and John McWhorter. There were a lot of people coming through campus in those years, and the students were actively involved in coming to these events and asking questions. There were some remarkable moments, moments that I will certainly never forget in my career. One of my favorite moments was uh, an evening with David Blight talking about the memory of the Civil War and how this was commemorated in the United States. Blight is a scholar uh, at Yale and the director of its uh, Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Blight gave an entire talk about how societies choose and don't choose to memorialize injustice. And he gave an entire talk about the Civil War and about the slaves. The first hand comes up in the audience. Professor Blight, how should a society choose to memorialize the Holocaust of the unborn? Well, you can imagine Brown University, that quieted the room pretty quickly. Uh, and in fact, a number of students hissed to think that the present day debate over abortion could in any way be compared to the debate over abolition and human bondage. But Blight didn't punt on the question. Blight took it, and he talked about the, the ways in which power works in a society to decide who gets to choose, and when they get to choose, and how they get to choose to define what are the holocausts, what are the injustices. It was very, very powerful. My other moment uh, that I will relate to you tonight was more comical, uh, but in the worst possible way. It was a public forum that took place in McMillan Hall, and in front of the, uh, the, the, the assembly hall, uh, a group of, of, of sort of neo-Nazi skinhead organizers were handing out uh, a pamphlet indicting the Jews for their complicity in the slave trade. And it looked like uh, just a single sheet and had the covers and some books and it said, you know, decisive proof, Jews responsible for the slave trade. Uh, because this was a public event, many different kinds of people were there, including uh, a group of, of black Muslims who were also in the room. Uh, so you had skinheads on one side, black Muslims on another, and a panel of, of brown professors up in front. Uh, one of the first people to get up and ask a question was a, a man from the Nation of Islam, who said, I just want to thank the panel at the front for finally telling the truth about the Jews and the slave trade. Well, needless to say, Jim Campbell says, that's not us. Up pops the skinhead. That's ours. And next thing you knew, you saw a conversation that you could not have predicted among people brought together around the issue of slavery. Profoundly uncomfortable, but profoundly telling. Over the course of that, those two years, perhaps the most important part was the role of Brown undergraduates. And what many of the undergraduates today don't realize is that the Slavery and Justice Initiative, while convening a faculty panel to write a report, was largely organized around the work of undergraduates in two years of a group research project run through the Africana Studies Department, which I had the pleasure of co-leading with Jim Campbell, who was the chair of the Slavery and Justice Committee. The first year, we had about 20 students, 20 undergraduates who were literally the shock troops for slavery and justice at Brown, but also the frontline researchers. These were undergraduates who spent many hours in the John Carter Brown Library uh, turning up new evidence about the 1764 slave ship Sally and its disastrous voyage from West Africa to the Caribbean. But these were also students who rallied their peers to these public events. And most importantly, these were students who wrote for the Slavery and Justice Committee their own report, their own series of recommendations, and struggled with some of the toughest questions that we're still struggling with today and that I think we're going to have to face head on which is to say, where does the work of slavery and justice end? Is it enough to do the kind of historical reconstruction that writes the experience of the enslaved and the tragedy of slavery itself into our national history? Is it enough to get that story right and disseminate that story to the school children of Rhode Island, to high school textbooks, uh, to our politicians, to our civic culture? Does getting the story right constitute an act of reparation. It does repair. But is that the beginning or is that the end? And for the students who confronted this in 2004, 2005, and 2006, they pushed so much harder than I think many of the faculty were willing to go. That getting the story right again is the beginning rather than the end. 
but that a meaningful reparation policy might involve, for instance, making Brown a living wage campus. That a meaningful reparation policy uh, might mean actually doing things to increase the diversity of the Brown faculty and the Brown student body, both of which had been relatively stuck over the previous decade. To get things right, it might involve actually changing the way we talk and teach and learn at Brown University, creating required classes, or instituting more public programming, or a required orientation event. It might require massively increasing the funding of the Third World Center. It might require doing a number of things, both within the university and beyond the university, that are more than simply getting the story right, but that are living our lives today in a way that is in accordance with an idea of social justice. That isn't merely about atoning for the past and this institution's responsibility to that past, but rather using that past as a motivational force for making the world better. And some of the students who were involved in this actually had gone on to do these things. Students who were involved in this initial project were involved, in fact, in changing the laws of Rhode Island to end the disfranchisement of felons. Students who were involved in this have gone on to take on public education in Providence and seek to reduce some of the racial disparities in educational opportunity in this city. This is something that the faculty needs, and it's something that I'm calling on the students here to provide us with into the future. You must push. You must drive the faculty to get beyond its comfort in simply saying, let us teach more and talk more. We need the students to get us to do more. And I look forward to speaking with you about that tonight and in the coming weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Seth Rockman, for that. Um, as a note, I forgot to mention like the timeline for each of the talks, which you did fine. Um, <laughs> about um, 15 minutes, 20 max, um, and we'll just keep on going with um, Marco McWilliams. violence with the 
beating and murder of Emmett Till. The name of the song was Karate Chop. I'll let you Google it and listen to the lyrics. I just really don't even feel like repeating it here. And one of my students said to me, she, she, she said, Mr. Mack, you know, it's really interesting because Emmett Till's father fought in the war defending this country, and this country murders him with his father's ring on his finger. This is a powerful moment. When we think about slavery and justice, we are always compelled to ask ourselves, what are the prevailing structures of power that somehow almost magically seem to continue to reproduce themselves? You see, you don't actually need white people around to have white supremacy continue to manifest itself. This is the sinister but clever work that white supremacy can do. We know that this is the 150 year so-called emancipation. And maybe we'll just return for a moment to this amendment, this 13th amendment. Neither slavery nor voluntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And so I ask, I always ask, does the 13th Amendment, did it abolish slavery? I argue no, it did not. It simply reformed the way in which we can enslave somebody the way in which we can extract their labor. You see, if we look between the commas, it says quite clearly, except as punishment for a crime where the party shall have been duly convicted. We have modern day slaves today, but we don't think of them as slaves. Where are they? Go to a state school right across town, Rhode Island College. You might see them in tan uniforms putting furniture into the dorms. Get in a car and drive down Interstate 95. You might find them out on the side of the road picking up trash and mowing and cutting down the foliage. They make maybe $2 a day. They are modern day slaves, a literal captive audience. Sometimes if they refuse to go on the work details from the ACI to prison, there's punishment. Okay, fine. Stay in your prison cell all day. They just work to maybe buy something in the commissary to get outside of the wall of, walls of the prison sometimes, to gaze at us, passing by, staring at them as they stare back at us. Their crime is irrelevant, it's immaterial at this point. After the Civil War, the nation has to have a conversation with what do we do with all of these black folk. Certainly they're not going to be citizens like we are citizens. Certainly they're not going to live and exist socially in this country as we exist. We need to find a way to reappropriate that labor and maintain the social status. The American Colonization Society has an idea, let's send them back to Africa. The British have their similar system. This is Liberia, this is Sierra Leone. Everybody's not going back. The 14th Amendment, okay, fine. Make a deal. You just, whoever was born here and you citizens, and that's what that is. Well, how do you know you're a citizen in a place? You can vote. That's the 15th Amendment. We all know this. Calling the Reconstruction Amendments, they have to one run one right after the other, back to back. America trying to have this conversation about what do we do with all these black folk. 
we know how the story goes. We're in the institution of higher learning. We know this narrative already. But how do we answer this question? How do we wrestle with this question? Vincent Harding might ask, he might say, the life of black people in this country constitutes the longest ongoing revolutionary struggle to date that we know. If anybody knows Vincent Harding's going to know, right? He he's, has this lifetime of writing and thinking about these things. For me, the slavery and justice is about a revolutionary project. It's an ongoing revolutionary project. And it looks different in time and space. And we have to figure out, or each generation has to figure out, what does it mean and what does it need to be in their contemporary moments? What are the levers of power that they need to pull? In what ways do they operate and work with the system? But it must be a revolutionary thrust and push. What kind of thoughts do we need to think? And after each revolutionary moment, there should be new thoughts that are generated that come out of that. What, what are the prevailing ideas that we need to continue to challenge? What kind of deep reading and deep thinking do we need to do? We have an interesting moment in the leftist community. There's this rush to run out into the streets. Let's just do action. Let's just, I don't know, march at Whole Foods, pull up a sign and then return protest Walmart. I'll be quite frank with you as I uh, begin to close my remarks. The, for me, this report and this, and this question of slavery and justice can only be answered with a revolutionary answer. Now, the debates around what revolution versus reform means is, is, is one that we can have, and it's ongoing. But I believe that we must be willing to like, ask the really hard questions and then not be afraid of the really hard answers. And we have to be willing to build, right? Because we might have an idea of what the answer means, it may not be a structure that exists yet. We might have to actually create something new in our contemporary moment. The, the same groups of people that continue to find themselves oppressed in this system never changes generation after generation. And so we have this ongoing pattern. It's an ongoing pattern. How do we disrupt it? How do, how do we stick our foot in that door? That's going to look different for everybody in the room. But we have to be willing to do the things that we need to do to disrupt that. Every school I've ever taught at, that I've ever been associated with, the administration always and you don't know how many times I've been called into the principal's office. <laughs> That's okay. It's going to look different each time. The, this question of slavery and justice, that's, that's hard. And we have to step up to meet that challenge. And we have this rich, 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 rich traditional struggle to look back on, right? We, 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 we have a, a, a blueprint, if you will. We have the syllabus, if you will. We're just in a different semester. So let's look back on the blueprint and let's find out what that is and what that means and what that looks like. Because it's not just a Southern thing. What did Malcolm X tell us? He said, anytime you cross the Canadian border, you in the South. Stop talking about the South. So sometimes that means we have to reorient ourselves. And this is the, actually the beauty of what Brown is doing, right? Brown is saying, yeah, OK, we the South. We finance this. Thank you. Thank you again, Marco, and last but not
not the police, Professor Anthony Brooks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to, to begin by thanking all the students who made this possible. Uh, when uh, we decided, Mr. Weinberg and myself, in the center, that we thought it important to have a student advisory committee, um, it was uh, like a light turn, bulb turn off. Um, you know, we, usually all centers are faculty and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, we thought, why not have a student advisory uh, council, a group of students that would work with us, that would essentially uh, decide what the program of the center should be for the students, and uh, that we wouldn't interfere at all, um, other than if asked. Um, but that they would, you know, do what they thought was necessary um, for brown students in relationship to the center um, going forward. And one of the things they suggested was this particular uh, uh, teaching, and so um, I want to commend them uh, for doing this. And they have a whole set of programs which I recommend that people look at on the website. I want to do three things uh, tonight. Firstly, I want to talk a little bit about the report itself. Then, secondly, I want to talk about the center, its possible future, its trajectory. And then thirdly, I want to talk some bit of, a little bit about this business of slavery and justice and the contemporary <coughs> ways in which you might want to think through this particular question. In 2003, the former president of Brown University as my colleague, uh, Professor Rockman has said, established a committee to investigate the relationship of Brown University to the Atlantic slave trade. It was a courageous decision, but it also meant that they, in, on the faculty committee, there were folks who wanted to know why is it that we were doing this. People would have thought, looking retrospectively, that what happened is that really everybody in the committee agreed. That's actually not true. We had a set of robust discussions, sometimes over lunch, sometimes not so much over lunch, about what it is that we were going to do. And at one stage after a retreat that was organized in, the, uh, in uh, Barrington, there was a sentiment that was beginning to emerge that we needed a minority report. A minority report because we felt that the actual committee could not agree as to what we needed to do with slavery and justice. And we had a discussion about whether or not we should have a minority report or not. And we came to the decision that we really shouldn't have a minority report. What we needed to do was to argue more. <laughs> so that, like typical academics and scholars and so on, we spent more time having a lot of conversation. And therefore, one of the things I want to suggest that emerges out of this discussion of slavery and justice was a certain kind of practice of conversation and argument. And I would want to suggest to you that that practice, that practice of conversation and argument becomes very important in all democratic forums. And that one of the, I think, one of the most important things for me, certainly, in the the Committee, was a certain kind of democratic practice, a way in which we would listen to each other, disagree, and then in which way in which we try and formulate ways in which we could move forward. And that practice of democracy was also very important because members of the committee were not concerned with their own position or themselves, but we were concerned more with, our, with the larger issue of the relationship of the university to the Atlantic slave trade and what kind of report we should write. Not what who we were, but what kind of report in the end could we write for a university that would actually take the university forward. The history is clear and one doesn't need to repeat it. Providence, the North, Professor Rotman and my work of work on this, has been implicated in the slave trade. One of the things that I think was important was that to, you know, was to, was to actually smash the idea that somehow slavery was just a southern phenomenon. Um, Rhode Island was pristine, New England, where this did not happen. But I think that the report made it very clear 
that one of the leading universities in this country and the world was deeply connected to, the, to, to Atlantic slavery. It wasn't just John Brown. It was the company that ran the Sally was called Brown Brothers. It had three. One who became an abolitionist, yes, Moses. Nicholas, who was the accountant. And John, who was, if you wish, a kind of swashbuckling, swashbuckling person, but who was really, and, and, who, and who they said was really the person who conceived this particular idea. But it was a Brown Brothers affair. It wasn't just one particular brother at all. One of the questions that faced us in, the, in doing this report was really, what should we do? I think it's very important to understand that this conversation on Brown Campus happened in a specific context in this country. First, that there was a, an attempt in the 1990s to have a conversation in this country with, led by John Hope Franklin, appointed by President Clinton. And that that conversation, with all due respect to the great historian, collapsed. And was, did not, was not, they were not able to achieve what it set out to do. But that secondly, there was an increased discussion in this country about the question of reparations. And one of the first things that people talked about in relationship to the committee was, are you a committee of reparations? I got that question many times when I traveled and went to other places. And many of the letters came in. Were essentially asking, are you or trying to find out, are you a, are you a committee of reparations? So that what the, co the committee had to do was to try and, if you wish, find a way to work its discussion and, dis and decisions about what it would do without getting caught into a collapse, something that had collapsed, an argument about race in this country, as well as trying to not get involved into the reparation arguments. Not that we would not discuss it, but that if you already said that's what you were going to do, then you would shut down a whole set of conversations that would actually, that could actually take place. So therefore, we spent a lot of time trying to think through how to manage this discussion, how to, is, how to get all sides, so people who believe in reparations, people who didn't believe in reparations, etc., to come and talk about how they saw the actual question. And there's something that I think we miss on campus, but which struck me last year in you know, Chicago, when I went to speak at a conference on slavery. And this was an academic conference on slavery. And um, nice sessions, 25 scholars, 50 scholars at max. And then on Sunday, we had a, they had a, they planned, they had an open session <coughs> in which they were going to talk about the legacies of slavery. And all of a sudden, 400 people turned up in the room. And they had to move us into another room because in the University of Illinois, Chicago. And it was, what was fascinating was that there was a way in which this question of slavery for black folks in Chicago had a specific set of meanings that sometimes we do not even have in the report. And I will never forget one woman who came to me after my talk and said to me, just an ordinary African-American woman, and said to me, do you know what, how we do repair? And I said, no, I'm telling you. She said, a group of us who have been descendants of slaves and descendants of slave masters get together every summer to talk through how can we live together. And I was stunned because this was no publicity. This was not a big show. This was just a group of ordinary people getting together to talk about, given the legacy of slavery, given racism in this country, how can we live Together, which to me is one of the fundamental questions that this business of slavery has raised. But I want to tell you that story because there is a way in which those of us in universities have to think very seriously about how we connect to communities in which the legacies and the histories of slavery is not yesterday, but actually is today. 
that people don't have a memory of it in the way we may still remember it. But the memory of it scarred their skin and is just always under the surface and only comes out at certain points when people explode for whatever reason. Okay, so therefore we had this great discussion and then we had to write it up. And one of the things about academics is that a great discussion of writing up sometimes is not so easy. So we had to write it up. And we had a writing team and we sat down. And then we added, we, in that writing team, we then ran into a major difficulty. What is the difficulty that we ran into? What is it that we should call slavery? And that one was a back and a fort and a back and forth, and there were drafts and redrafts, and to find the actual language for it. When we decided upon saying that slavery was a crime against humanity, there was immediately a, another discussion that that generated. And that was, there was just a Durban conference in 2003 which said that slavery was a crime against humanity, but which also simultaneously called for reparations. So the question that faced us was, okay, are we now going to say slavery is, against, is a crime against humanity and join the actual Durban Conference called 2003 for what the Durban Conference called in Clause 1 for compensation for slavery and colonialism. And so, again, that created a set of discussions. So I think that I want to give you a flavor of some of the ways in which we did this and how we came upon certain things. So when we essentially said in the report that slavery is a crime against humanity, what we were actually doing was making a specific step statement, not just for, not for reparations, but I think trying to capture the way in which a historical trauma has a certain kind of consequence in a country. Because you then have to ask yourself this question. If slavery is part of the inauguration of this country, racial slavery, then if this country is inaugurated in first a genocide against the indigenous population, and then, you know, then the second move is and his, uh, then is this crime against humanity, then what are the set of structural consequences of those things upon the present day? In other words, how can you think about the past without not thinking about the present? And what, therefore, kind of country do we live in and what is it that we needed to do? As a university, we therefore were not, we could not be involved in my view in a certain kind of reparations that some people were asking. That's not a university. It's not the work of a university. So the question is, what kind of repair could we do? The committee, pushed by students and others, decided upon six things, which I'll just tell you very quickly. One is to tell the truth in all its complexity. Secondly, it was memorialization. Thirdly, was to create a center for the study of slavery and justice. Fourthly was to maintain high ethical standards in regard to investments and gifts. And this was very important. So in other words, you have forced labor elsewhere where you invest your money and so on. Fifthly was to have expanded opportunities for brown and brown for those who are disadvantaged, disadvantaged by the legacies of slavery and the slave trade, slave, slave trade. And sixthly and finally was to use the resources of the university to help ensure a quality, a quality education for the children of Rhode Island. Those were the recommendations, and then we tried to spend a couple of years trying, if you wish, to implement them. Now, what do I think is important? Let me move on to my second point about the center. The center is, if you read this our website, is essentially a scholarly research center, but also has a public education mission. 
I think the Scholar Research Center is clear, so I will not spend time trying to explain what we mean by that, except to make one point. That one of the things that I think we would want to do is to really to be a site for cutting edge scholarship, which means for young people who are daring, which means for people who are trying to think through some of these questions in ways which may not seem conventional in the normalized way to many of us. So therefore, to take a chance in opening up the field of the study of slavery in a historical way. So cutting edge scholarship, which doesn't mean that we will ignore all the great work that has been done, or in fact, don't pay tribute to it. It doesn't mean that. It all, but it also means that we try to think about what happens at an unusual rate, what are the different uh, people who are, if you wish, to use the phrase of Ida B. Wells, people who are troubling the waters that have become important for us to, and trying to force us to think in a different way. So let me think, talk a little bit about its public education mission. The public education mission of the center in my view rests on two things. One, a certain kind of education to say to people what slavery was and what is a certain kind of narrative about the enslaved and about questions to do with abolition. Some of us may think that this is not very important. But last week, two weeks ago, I received an invitation to review a major museum in France at last that has been set up for the abolition of slavery. It is an the architecture, the design of it is absolutely amazing. They have received a World Architectural Prize for it, and they should, in terms of the design. But I spent some time looking at the narratives that this museum tells its viewers. And there's a line there, it's an abolition museum. And there's a timeline of abolition. And this is how it goes. 1789, the French Revolution. 1794, the abolition of slavery. 1803, Napoleon reinstates slavery. 1807, the slave trade outlaw. And I thought to myself, oh, whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Let's backtrack a bit. 1789, the French Revolution, absolutely historically important event. I agree. <laughs> absolutely. I have studied it. I have read Marx on it. I come from a certain position. Absolutely. But the abolition of slavery in Paris in the National Assembly was only due to a group of ex-slaves in Haiti led by Toussaint Overture, who forced them to think about the abolition of slavery. It was not on the cards. So I said, no, no, perhaps, perhaps it's just a mistake. I mean, let me check, let me check me further on. Let me give the benefit of the doubt in this matter. So I read further on, and I see they end up with Martin Luther King, who I love and admire very, and teach in class, Nelson Mandela, who I admire greatly, I have a poster of him, I'm an artist from South Africa, <laughs> has, just me, has just sent me a really fantastic rendition of him from, from my office. So, and because I also teach in South Africa, so I, you know, I love him dearly. But I don't see Toussaint on the and I don't see the ex the slaves. So my argument is therefore there is a story of abolition here that's been told in which freedom is given from above and which those who were enslaved had nothing at all to do with it. So it would seem to me that those of us who are thinking about the historical questions of slavery and justice, that if you think about justice as fairness, then one not only has to begin to tell a story of where slaves were and who had slaves and who didn't have slaves, but also one had to begin to tell the story about the abolition in a way that foregrounds a little bit, if you wish, the actions of those who were enslaved. Because the question of those who were enslaved, if you focus on them, tells us perhaps a little bit 
different story, a much more complicated story about this business of slavery and about this business of abolition. So I believe that one of our public education missions is going to have to be an intervention into a set of discourses about slavery and about abolition. And so I've written a long article to the people in Nice. I had the architect who decided to come here, and he and I sat down for two hours, and we had a really great discussion, and then we spent a weekend exchanging emails. And what was fascinating was that he ended up by saying, perhaps our absences that we had in the museum tells us a great deal. Then I wrote back and said, couldn't agree with you more. But my point, therefore, is that the question of the narrative and the story still is one that needs to be told. Not in terms of just silences, but needs to be told in terms of from whose perspective one is telling a certain kind of story. So that's our first, one of our mission, one of our things that we will do. The second thing has to do with this, what I like to call the justice piece. And this justice piece is a complicated piece. It's a complicated piece because justice is not just about repair. Justice is not just about, if you wish, a certain kind of distributive justice, reparative justice. Justice is not about just about business of rights. I think justice also has to begin to think through and work with the consequences and legacies of slavery in the United States, in Brazil, and elsewhere. So that, for example, justice would mean for us to understand that we do not live in a post-racial society. And what, do you, what does we mean when we say we don't live in a post-racial society? It would mean what are the legacies of racial slavery, structural legacies of racial slavery upon the education system, upon the unemployment system, upon unemployment among black folks in this country, and obviously on the justice system. Why so many black men and increasingly black women are incarcerated. And then there's another piece to it. And this is even perhaps the most more difficult than looking at the legacies, and it is this. If we think about slavery and just slavery as a system that helps to inaugurate the modern world in which we live in, then we might want to think about the ways in which forms of servitude and bondage today draw from and are linked to the ways in which slavery operated. In other words, how do these things reorganize and readapt themselves to power to actually put people in bondage today? And therefore, the justice piece is what? Is looking at the questions of race in this country and questions of inequities around it, but is also looking at the business of human bondage elsewhere and the ways in which human bondage work elsewhere. And how do we, in fact, intervene in that and make a set of statements about that? Because you can't, quite frankly, think about in this globalized world just one form of oppression and think that somehow it is not linked to another form of oppression somewhere else. We, quite frankly, live in a very deeply interconnected world with a set of power relations that are actually quite deeply connected and work together sometimes in tandem, even if they have disagreements amongst themselves. Therefore, our justice piece is going to be, hopefully, one in which we think about questions of race in this country and in Brazil and elsewhere, but also that we also think about other forms of human bondage and what it is that we need to do. And in that sense, therefore, this, I hope the center is going to have a certain kind of activist side to it. That is a, a capacity to intervene publicly, nationally, and internationally when necessary 
on these particular points. Let me just end by saying this. Why is it, therefore, I would, th I would think <coughs> that a Center for Slavery and Justice in 2013 has to have to walk on these two legs, walk on historical leg to be able to continually tell a new narrative because it is needed, walk on the leg of justice to be able to intervene into the contemporary forms of human bondage and into the legacies of structural racism in this country. I think that the center has to do that because at the heart of the question of slavery and justice is a fundamental question. That fundamental question is simple freedom. And if that question of freedom is the fundamental question, then any center that's trying to work through the issues of slavery and justice in the contemporary world has to open itself to those who are trying to seek freedom in the contemporary world. And freedom is a complicated thing because I'm not talking about a freedom that allows wars to take place. I'm not talking about a freedom in which people can murder people and then call it freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to talk about, I'm trying, I'm talking about a freedom that the enslaved themselves thought they could have. Mm -hmm. And that kind of freedom is one where human bondage and domination is minimal. And I hope that's the work of the center. Thanks very much. Give one more round of applause for all the panelists. <laughs> so now we're going to turn it over to the audience. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose to our panelists today? I'll give you like a moment to think about it. <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll let the person if you don't. <laughs> I'll start it off. Um, could you, would you refer to the World Conference against racism, the United Nations World Conference against racism? Yeah, Durham Conference. Durham. 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 Yeah, I was there. It was 2001. 2000, sorry, thank you. 2001. And I just want to tell you that the mo it was the most amazing experience. Mm -hmm. And it sent a shockwave around the world. The U.S. and Israeli <laughs> delegation walked out. It was so deep. I sat there. You know, you remember the whole stuff about the millennium, you know, the year 2000, that was all that hype, the computers were going to crash, and comments were going to hit us. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff. And I was saying, oh, this is the millennium. Because a lot of people said, the millennium is until 2001, you know. So I sat there one night just after one of those amazing days looking at the Indian Ocean and saying, this is amazing. This is really deep. This is something, some kind of genius out of the bottle here. But they were able to wipe it out. They had a thing that could bl blow that off of all the news channels worldwide. Um, after Durban, we went up to the um, United Mine Workers compound for a few days in Johannesburg. Went to my room at our lunchtime there, which was 9 in the morning and a plane just hit the tower. Mm -hmm. That stuff was timed so perfectly to destroy that amazing, amazing development down there in Southern Ireland. It was really um, uh, And I also, one, one thing that I'm blown away by is the, uh, um, well, I, I'm starting to see people try to put numbers on reparations lately, and, um, you know, calculating Two million people, seventy years, minimum wage as it is today, and I mean, uh, you've got people who have to make a decision on which you want to average their hours, you know, that, you know. And um, so I saw somebody coming up with a three trillion dollar figure at ten hours, figuring ten hours a day. And I don't think it was any, not many tens, I mean, right? I think you were talking about at least twelve hours a day, pretty much, right? 
Uh, if you figure a day off, which I'm sure some had and some didn't, um, you, at today's minimum, uh, you're definitely in uh, somewhere above that, at least between there, 10 trillion. And um, I mean, my math might not be off, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I I just, I just want to respond to, to I mean, thanks, yeah, it's 2001, 9-11, um, you know, kind of ch shifted the agenda. Um, I, this, I mean, some, this is, I want to say something about reparation. And uh, I have a lot of, a lot of my colleagues in the Caribbean, African Americans who quarrel with me, Africa, quarrel with me around about this. But, I think that one has to see that the reparation argument emerges at a moment in history when social struggles for equality and freedom are muted. That what, because people are always attempting to try and find a way in which they can do things to better their lives. And when you have a context in which I think neoliberalism becomes such a powerful force. One of the things that has happened is that people therefore reach for something that they think is important and is important that can give them some repair, both historical and contemporary. But the struggle for reparations and to put money on it and so on, as important as that is, in my view does not obviate and does not touch the set of struggles that one needs to transform the world into a better place. The difficulty is that, in my view, is that one of the arguments about reparations, and I'm not fighting against it, eh? because I understand it, I think, and it's a motivation for it. But one of the arguments about it is that it actually places the way in which ordinary people should struggle for a better world, puts it on a footing of certain kind of monetary quantification that one has to think very hard about. And I have no problems with monetary quantification. Please, I'm not arguing against it. But when you become subsumed with monetary quantification, you have to ask yourself whether or not power which, con which has constructed us mm -hmm. as a certain kind of human being where we are nothing else in the neo on the neoliberalism than consuming subjects and economic instruments, rationalities and instruments. Nothing else. We are nothing else according to power and the power of capital. So that therefore, if you are going to count yourself in that game, are you operating on a terrain that has been constructed for you? Or are you, should you not be thinking about how you operate on a different terrain that allows you to transform and change the world? Because in my view, what the slaves wanted, the enslaved, was always to change the world. That's what they wanted. That's the legacy. That's the legacy of the civil rights movement. The legacy is not the postage stamp and the I have a dream speech. Mm -hmm. That's not the legacy. That's right. The legacy is about the transformation of America and the world into something else. Mm -hmm. Into what? I don't know. It's what we have to do. But my friends quarrel with me. That's fine. So let's say that. Uh, I, I was kind of thinking along the same lines uh, as Brooks just spoke of. Um, I am against reparation as a matter of principle. Because once you put monetary value on what somebody has gone through, you demean the dignity of that person mm -hmm. to a quantity, to a monetary value. My second point is, what about X amount of money you put on operations if 
that is satisfied. No, I don't know how much trillions, how many billions you want to die. Once that is done, the person, the power, the institution that is giving you that money for reparations, you are absorbing that power of other responsibilities that should be placed on that institution. That is very, very important. My brother in the middle, uh, I come from Ghana. Ghana has the oldest fort that was built by the European outside of Europe. I worked on some of the slaves, forts, and castles over there. For us in Africa, welcoming, accept somebody in, let's trade, and it turns into something else. For all these hundreds of years till today, unless we change the structure and the functions of the unbridled capitalism that exists in the world, which we are turning now into globalization, we will never solve the problems of poverty, of environmental conservation, of slavery, of social justice. That is the heart of the problem. Why would we put somebody in a ship and sell the person in for money. Even after 1865, when uh, Lincoln died, all the presidents who came after him, what happened? There was another form of slavery, which was called by another name. PBS is running a documentary now, Slavery by Another Name. And none of that is in the history books. Nobody knows about it. So, my thinking is that I hope you, you put in your TV set and you say, oh, the market is going up, stock exchange is going up, something is going down. My, my question is, how on earth do you think something should go up forever? A balloon that goes up will burst and come down. It is us as human beings for us to think about what we value in society. Unfortunately, the Eurocentric model of development has overemphasized material things. Money, house, wealth, status over everything else. And so, like Professor Brock says, we, if we don't take care, we'll be caught in that narrative. Somebody will set up the structure for us and fit us in there. So unless we change those structures, we will not be able to alleviate poverty. We will not be able to, to reduce or to solve the social economic problems that plague the world. Because the slavery, the legacy of slavery we are seeing here in the United States is happening in another form elsewhere in the world, everywhere in the world. And I must have thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for that. I agree. And let me say, there is no European model of development. That, that's a misnomer. For black people, for Africa, <laughs> For the brown world, the, the notion that there is a European model of development is untrue. And we have, before colonialism, Europe has never once ever intended to develop Africa. They say develop, but they don't mean develop the way they mean develop. Professor Dr. Bowles just said, in France, they built this beautiful architecture. And he's looking at the literature, and he's like, what is this? Did we, other than a pretty building. So right, with, fundamentally the structure is about exploitation, appropriation, domination, death, holocaust, genocide, even outside of the definitions we use, use with, when we talk about international law. So I believe that we fundamentally have to think completely differently outside of, because even European thought, to think through European thought is also very dangerous. You can't let somebody else tell you what your freedom is, what your, that freedom looks like. We, we have to have our own language, our own definitions. And so, yeah, I mean, 
if we, I, I'm thinking particularly about Kenya and the Mau Mau Revolution, who's the first people that they start killing? Complicit black <laughs> colonial sympathizers. Any Africans that they saw complicit with the British, they, that's the first people, they actually killed very few British. Why are they doing this? Because they're like, no, we got a fundamental problem. It's not just about running the British out. Who are the other African sympathizers? They're trying to get at that thing from the root. So, I, no, I, right. I mean, I, I agree with that. Any other um, questions that want to? Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, at these other conferences, or just in general, Brown is at the forefront of the work of the center is to me, um, especially in terms of universities. What are some ways in which the center are engaging, is engaging with other universities and other institutions around America <coughs> um, so that these conversations aren't just within our university, but yeah, they, they, let me just say, the center was formed and launched on, in um, July 2012. We got an office, we got an office in October. <laughs> um, we are, we, we spent, Ms. Weinberg and myself and uh, uh, Professor Rothman, who's on the advisory committee, we spent uh, one semester trying to think about what to do, how to have programs, you know, which, you know, which, 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 which um, and this is what part of the, part of that. Um, we are, there's a, we, we try to operate systematically, right, you know, there are a couple of things. Um, one is to reconnect back to the university community. I mean, you know, the students who are here in 2012, 11, 12, 13, and not the students who were here in 2004, 5, 6, 7, when we, you know, just not, a different community. So we have to have a set of discussions about the center so that people know what we are doing. We, you know, we have to be strong here first before we begin to think about going outside. We have to have got to think about what to do, <coughs> sorry, with faculty. We're just having that discussion. I just had a discussion with the dean of the college this afternoon. We have agreed on an undergraduate fellow for the, faculty, for the center. Right? I mean, so you know, we, we, we're trying to put the way we will, we will have a graduate faculty, um, sorry, graduate uh, fellow as well. So you know, we have to take a postdocs and so on. So we have to do the normal things, and then we, we then we begin to once we I think have a certain presence at Brown, then we can begin to um, get engage with other universities about you know about their own issues. Um, the other thing is that we, I don't well for myself, right? A lot of people can speak. I don't necessarily believe in going to say to another university anything. I mean, I also believe in a set of collaborations. Um, so one of the things that we will try and do, for example, um, is to see where there are centers in the United States um, and in, around the world. We, we have a strategic, we have a, a workshop in May, which if you look at it is actually a strategic workshop because it has people who are involved in a set of projects from slave lodges in South Africa to this project that um, Professor Rothman talked about, the person who heads the project, who can't come, which is going to send, send us her second. Um, to, to begin to think about, okay, how then do we have a set of relationships with other, with other, sets, with, with, with other people? But bear in mind, and, and we've been in discussion, for example, with the Yale Center from, from, the, from before, you know, from early. Uh, but bear in mind, I think that, I think we have a distinctive responsibility. And that responsibility is what I try to talk about. In other words, to do the business of slavery historically, but to do the justice piece as well. Um, and therefore, to have, find a way to intervene in the world in a certain way. Um, and holding up a certain kind of scholarship and a certain kind of ethical, if you wish, way in which we need to operate um, within the world. So, I mean, so that, so yes, I take that point, but uh, if, if, we are, if we are in this room or somewhere else in a year and a half, ask me that question. And if I can't answer you, then you can say you have not done your job for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, if I can add to that briefly, I mean, one of the things that I think Brown's model has done is shown the world of American higher education that the world will not end if you discover the truth, and if you <laughs> dig into your archive, and if you do the hard work of discovery, uh, the world will not come crashing to a halt, but the world, in fact, could become a better place. 
And I think as other universities, particularly high status universities, have, have seen Brown actually, you know, its reputation rise in, in the world by virtue of confronting its past rather than being tarnished and shunned by the rest of the nation. Uh, places like Princeton, places like Harvard have been willing to move towards this, although not in any way close to with the uh, support of the central administration. This past, this current spring, Princeton is offering its first undergraduate course on Princeton and slavery. It's an undergraduate research seminar where Professor Marnie Sandweiss has a group of undergraduates basically trolling through the Princeton archive to see how many different kinds of stories you can tell about the institution's relation to slavery. A group of students at Harvard uh, with Professor Sven Beckert uh, and Professor e Evelyn Higginbotham uh, did this uh, about a year or so ago. So it's happening sort of through faculty working with undergraduates simply to do this work of discovery. But this work of discovery is really important and it's another place where I think when we look back from some distance we will come to credit the reparations movement as being the force that has made this happen. So even if in the 1990s the movement for monetary reparations found no standing in court, found no ability to compel, to compel corporations like Aetna to pay money. The fact that a, a strategy of litigation was created and the fact that a national coordinate, a reparations coordinating committee was formed and the fact that pressure groups and activists put on the state of California to create a state insurance registry in which every insurance company licensed in the state of California had to disclose whether or not it had any historical relationship to slavery. The fact that activists got the city council of Chicago to pass a, a municipal ordinance saying that any corporation that had a municipal contract had to do this work of discovery or lose that contract. What the reparations movement did, and this is what got President Simmons to get out in front of this issue when someone like Charles Ogletree said that Brown was likely to be named as a defendant. It has forced organizations, institutions, and corporations to tell the truth or at least to start the work of opening up those archives and recognizing simply once you scratch the surface how many, many, many entanglements every single institution in this country has with the Atlantic slave trade and, and the appropriation and exploitation, financialization, commodification of black bodies through American history. We'll take this one question in the front and possibly one more. Um, it's like, it seems to kind of a you mentioned it's a slippery slope between talking about one form of oppression and it being a forced membrane to talk about other forms of oppression. I was wondering, I, like the definition of slavery is also a porous membrane, and um, I was wondering where, what commerce, like do the conversations of talking about types of slavery, like like debt slavery, wage slavery, and sex slavery, and um, types of slavery that, you know, and, and like the you know, slavery is still very much a real, slavery is, is happening today now. Um, at what point do we put a frame around the conversation and say, you know, th this, this is what we're talking about and it's not this yet. And what time do we kind of like broaden our lens? Yeah, and that, what responsibilities do we have to yeah. all that? Could, could, I, could I say to you that I think that that is a conversation I'm hoping that we would have on Brown's campus. Um, I have, a, I know that there are many uh, positions on this, and I know that many people today talk about modern-day slavery. Um, and I myself, uh, I'm quite frankly a little uneasy, and I've read all the literature. Yeah. Now, it's one of the things I did when I became director. I sat down and I read everything I could on modern-day slavery, all the theoretical works, all the empirical studies. Um, and I'm still uneasy mm -hmm. about, about, about that um, because slavery is a, a, an ancient institution uh, of human bondage and domination that has different forms to it. Mm -hmm. That the Atlantic form and the Indian Ocean form was a specific form of racial slavery. Which is what I call, like the, you know, the legacies of, um, sorry, what I call it, um, what happened to the Atlantic coral and in places like South Africa and so on. Whether or not I would want to call debt slavery, um, or somebody working for very low wages, or, or sex trafficking, so whether or not I think one calls that slavery, I have properly, if you wish, I have a question mark. 
or however I understand the use of the word politically as a metaphor to draw attention to a certain form of human domination. And slavery, in, in, and linguistically, if you look at the actual genealogy of the way in which slavery was used, it has always been used as a metaphor for, for human domination. Even the founding fathers in this country, when they were arguing against the British, mm -hmm. talked about coming out of slavery. Mm -hmm. while they were beating other people. Right? So that the question of slavery has always been the word slavery, the, the, the etymology of it in the way it has been used, has always been, if you wish, a, a, to be deployed as a certain metaphor. I think that one of the things that I would like us to do on Brown's campus, as one contribution of the center, is to begin to have a robust discussion to that, about that, so we can begin to frame the contemporary problem <coughs> in a certain way. And I don't, and I, you know, I, mean, I say what I have eases, but one is open, one has got to be open to all the influences and, and, the, set of, um, and the set of positions that come, or that, 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 uh, that, that can come. And so the frame for me, therefore, is to, if you listen to me carefully, I said, I, I, I said human bondage. Right? Because what I'm, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it's there at this moment forms of human bondage that we want to think about very, very carefully and study empirically and understand it to be able to frame the thing in a certain, in a certain way. Because my final point is that in politics, framing is always important. Always important. If you don't frame what you're doing in a certain way, you run the risk of all sorts of difficulties down the line. So, so, let me, so let me say that one of the things I hope we can do in 2014 is to have that discussion. 2013, 2014, sorry, is to have that kind of discussion. And hopefully, students like yourself and Brian and everybody else will come and knock us on the heads a lot. <laughs> right? And push us, as Professor Rockman said. On that note then, um, I'd like us to all thank our panelists one more time. Um, with that, please um, stay tuned for others, um, other of the center's activities. I think there's, I think Ms. Weinberg was saying there's a paper here that people to sign up. Yeah, there's a, um, a sign-in sheet on the, on the pedestal over there. Um, please sign up to be in contact, and thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you for coming to speak.